And if you would find your 4.8 study guide from Friday, we are looking at some things with ionic and net ionic equations for acid base reactions. And we did the first half of the page and we still had to do the bottom half of the page. And I want to just kind of refresh your memory on what we were doing with that. I know we did number nine together. It was, I think the last one we did, maybe we did number 10. I can't kind of remember. I felt like we were getting pretty close. We didn't. I'm just going to uh, rehash number nine. I know you got it in your notes, maybe you didn't, but let's see. Here's what we're doing. I'm going to just focus on the shortcut because ultimately you're going to be asked to do the net ionic equation for these anyhow. So the shortcut is just getting to the net ionic equation. Let's say we've got a strong acid like HCl. In a strong acid, we've got our list of strong acids, we've got a list of strong bases. They completely ionize 100% and they produce lots and lots of hydrogen ions and chlorine ions in solution. When it's a strong acid, bring down the active ingredient. This is the hydrogen. If it was a strong base, we'd bring down the hydroxide. If it's a weak base, as it is in this case, ammonium hydroxide, because in weak acids and weak bases, they don't dissociate very well, and the compound itself is the predominating species. The molecule itself is the predominating species. So we bring down the pieces that you need from each one. Chlorine is basically a spectator ion, so I'm not even bringing it into the mix. Then we try to make water, because acids plus bases make some kind of salt in water. Hydrogen and hydroxide will make some water. This form from the HOH, it will free up the ammonium ion. <coughs> and that will be released into solution. So the ammonium ion is a part of the salt that would have been formed, ammonium chloride, as is the base to make a salt in water. But the chlorine is a spectator ion because it was an ion here and it would have been an ion there and we eliminate things that are the same on both sides. The ammonium is not eliminated because it was in a compound here and it's free over here. And by that definition, it's different on both sides. And that's why that one was not eliminated. So that's how we got that answer. Now, if we did number 10, it's a little different. Ammonia is a weak base, and it's perhaps one of the most common examples of a weak base that they like to use in our textbook. This is a strong acid. So we bring down the weak base, any three. And we're going to bring down the hydrogen. And then you try to make water, and that's not going to go so well because there's no oxygen. So then we actually have to kind of think of um, our acid base definitions a little bit. Acids are hydrogen donors, bases are hydrogen receivers. So the hydrogen in an acid base reaction, at least the Brunson Lowry definition, transfers from the acid to the base. And yeah, we try to make water, but we can't. But what we're going to do is make in the process of that. If you can't make water, then you got to think of the said lowry definition and uh, think about where the hydrogen is donated from and where it's being received. And that's all there is to that one. If you take a neutral molecule and you add a charged particle to it, it's going to take on that charge and add that extra piece to it. Um, just so you're kind of a little side note because it's going to the bottom part here. So this is what it looks like by itself. Yeah, the molecule. <clears throat> and when you add a hydrogen to it, it's just taking advantage of that, that one spot up here. 
that's another bonding location that it can take on. And uh, then this whole thing is taken on a plus one charge. So it goes from ammonia to ammonium. That's part of the reason why they got the similar name thing, because this combination of ammonia and ammonium are something that you see lots and lots of. They're like alter egos of each other. So let's look at uh, this one. Weak acid, I know, because there's hydrogen out in front. Strong base, it's an alkaline metal hydroxide. Do we add strong base? Bring down the hydroxide. You can bring down two hydroxides if you want, because there's actually two in there. You try to make water, and we can. We have the hydrogen and the hydroxide, and we'll make some water. We will free up the nitrite ion and have O2 plus one. So the Barium was eliminated completely. It was a spectator ion. It would have made barium nitrite. Um, the nitrite, however, wasn't eliminated because it was a compound here. And it's an individual ion there. It's not the same on both sides. It's changing from one side to the other. If you did um, a balancing thing, you're like, wait, there's two hydroxides here. That's fine. Because there is two hydroxides there. Then you would need two acid molecules to so you'd make two water molecules, and you get two nitrites, and that would also be balanced. So either way, it's balanced. So if you did it with the twos or without, in this case, it would be fine either way. Yep. I haven't been including the aqueous and the liquid on the on the water, uh, just because it's so tedious. Right, it's taking place in solution. I just I, I haven't, but uh, everything would be aqueous except for the water, which would be a liquid. Number twelve is, you know, I, you would have directions that would say, you know, write the NADAC equation for this acid-base reaction, so you know you're doing that type of thing. But now it's not telegraphing to you if it's a strong acid or a weak acid, strong base or weak base. So you need to know that information. Hydrogen cyanide or hydrocyanic acid is not on the list of strong acids, so it must be a weak acid. Alkali metal hydroxide is a strong base. In this chapter is weak, weak. I'm not going to give you a weak acid and a weak base when we deal with equilibrium. So bringing it up now just makes things messy, too messy. Um, bring down the whole thing for the weak acid, HCN. Bring down the active ingredient from the hydroxide, from the uh, base. Try to make water. We can do it this time. And when we make water, we release the cyanide ion. And we look to see that it's balanced, and it is. So there's our net ionic equation. So is the rule pretty much like if it's a weak weak acid or weak base, you just bring the whole thing down? Bring it all down. If it's a strong acid or a strong base, bring down the hydrogen from the acids, bring down the hydroxide if it's a base. Try to make water if you can. But sometimes, like number 13, you can't make water. So let's show you how that one works. Okay, I know it's an acid-base reaction because the pressure's up there say it. I know I'm trying to do the net ionic equation. I know this is a strong acid because it's on my list that I've memorized. And if it's an acid-base reaction, well, then this must be a base. And it's not a metal hydroxide. Basically, what they've done here is they've disguised um, the amine group in this. So, like, let's say I don't want to crawl myself out here. I'm just going to this little something here. Get this out of the way. If you had N, if you had ammonia, you said it looked like this. And sometimes what they'll do is they'll use the ammonia base and they'll change one of the appendages. 
So what if we took out one of those hydrogens and made it a C This group here is the amine group. It's what makes it a base in the first place. Um, we just kind of disguised the ammonia here. So it's really no different than what this one's doing. They do that a lot. They can make this even more stuff if they want. Sometimes they'll, they'll change two of the appendages and have it, you know, CH3 and HCH3 again or something like that. They'll, they'll You'll change both sides of it. This is a weak base. We bring down the whole thing. We bring down the hydrogen. If I make water, we can't. That's a clue that we're going to have to think about this from the Bronsted Lowry definition. Hydrogen donor for the acid, hydrogen receiver for the base. We take this CH3 I'm just going to add that hydrogen up here where there's that lone pair on the nitrogen, just to kind of like the same thing we do with the ammonia. And uh, tack it on there. So it's always a little clumsier when you can't make water, but it's going to be similar to an ammonia example. Does that. This is always a section that gives people some difficulty on a test. I think they, you know, they see it in class. They're like, okay, I kind of get what he did. He said the same thing over and over again. Um, but then when they get to a test, they forgot it. So I did put a bunch of extra ones of this. I know there's some from the textbook, but I put some extra ones in the uh, supplemental assignment as well, just so you get some more practice with that. But really pay attention to those and don't, don't underestimate them because it's, even though it's a free response and there's not a, either you're going to do it right or you're going to really do it bad. It's going to, you're going to either butcher it to the point where I can't give you partial credit or you're going to get it right. It's usually how it works with that. So. You have to both separate the from the No, they're one compound. I just had a little bit of an extra space right there, but just one compound. If you can't make um, water, does that mean you just bring down the hydrogen? You're bringing down the hydrogen, but you're using the Bronsted Lowry definition, which says acids are a donor, and you're just tacking the hydrogen onto the base. Okay, so then the hydrogen is like a last resort then? If you can't make water, you try and make water first. But if there's no hydroxides in there, you're not going to be able to make water. So then you have to do this style. Uh, um, I can be a little bit flexible with that, but knowing what the structure looks like, I knew it had to go on the on the nitrogen. Um, I always add it to the nitrogen when we got a ammonia, because ammonia always becomes ammonium, and I just apply that to any other one that has the nitrogen hydrogen combination in there. Kind of switching gears again, but we're still in the same section. So let's take a look at this. Quantitative analysis and acid-base titrations. Our lab will ultimately be an acid-base titrations or a quantitative analysis lab. Sometimes goes by the name volumetric analysis. Volumetric analysis, we're using uh, very detailed volumes of known titrants in order to uh, calculate what's going on in the reaction. Volumetric analysis is a technique for determining the amount of a certain substance by doing a titration. A titration involves delivery from a burette of a measured volume of solution of known concentration. We 
we call the patrons. Um, so here's essentially what's happening. We have our unknown samples out here that we're analyzing. And maybe we want to figure out how many molar this sample of solution is on the bottom. And then up here, we would have a certain known volume of our titrant. <laughs> And if we know the molarity of the titrant and we measure the volume of the titrant needed to react with this, we can use the, the titrant to solve for the unknown. And that's easy to see when we look at the example here, how that would uh, play out. <coughs> Pickle. So let's take a look at number one and we'll get an idea how that would work. Here we've got a sample of solid sodium hydroxide mixed with water. 100 milliliter sample of the solution, the strontium hydroxide solution is titrated with 60 milliliters of a 0.4 molar solution of hydrochloric acid. The hydrochloric acid, we know everything about it. We know its volume and we know its, and the unknown is the uh, strontium hydroxide. We want to figure out the concentration of the strontium hydroxide. So we'd start out with uh, reacting with H6, take some strontium chloride, and I'm just leaving this in double replacement form because it's the easiest to balance and write out real quick. Two hydroxides will react with two hydrogens from the HCl to make two water molecules. And then we know what we know, so mill HCl, that's a 0.400 molar solution. If you know everything about the HCl, that will what we don't know about the strontium hydroxide. We know we have 100 mil of it. We want to know the molarity, <coughs> the concentration. And to do that, I'm leaving for the moles. If I know moles in milliliters, I can get moles per liter and get the molarity that way. So it's ready to be solved. It's just a, another stoichiometry, solution stoichiometry kind of thing. The thing that uh, seemed to trip up a few people uh, in first block was your titrations tend to be a reactant to reactant. You want to find out exactly how much of this will react with this reactant to reactant. You don't really care about the products that much, and that was not clicking for some people first block, but this tends to be reactant to reactant chemistry. So with all we know, 60 mil, um, milliliters into liters is like the most common step that we do this chapter. 0.400 moles per liter for the HCl. Two moles makes one mole. And we can get the volume, or excuse me, the moles as 0 0.0120 moles. That's not the answer, but it's a little crowded over there, so I circle it. And now I can finish off the problem. Zero 120 moles of strontium hydroxide in 100 milliliters of solution. That's moles per milliliter. Let's just get that into moles per liter. Point one twenty molar strontium hydroxide solution is what we analyzed. HCl was the titrant. We knew everything about it. The sample being analyzed for its concentration was a strontium hydroxide. 
Whenever you're solving for molarity in an acid-base titration, molarity is a, a little bit more work because you have to do it as two separate steps. You can't uh, just go from the molarity of one to the molarity of the other one with the information that's provided. So you have to make it a two-step process to meet this step right here. Number two, it's got that ionic equation thing going on. It's a redox reaction. It's balanced. So since it's already balanced, we don't really need to know anything about redox. But it takes a little getting used to using an ionic equation. So we did at least one of those last week, and uh, I think we're going to do a couple more today. Here we've got 20 milliliters of a 0.1 molar potassium dichromate solution. So potassium dichromate doesn't show up in the balanced equation, but it must be where the chromate ion, dichromate ion, uh, came from. So underneath this, I'm going to write down the 20 mil and the 0.100 molar, but that must be coming from the uh, K2CR2O7. And then I have um, my titration, and I've got 50 milliliters of iron tube solution. And I want to know the uh, molarity of the iron tube. Figure out the x molar. Figure out how many moles of iron first, like we did in the previous problem. So we'll just connect from here to here. Again, it's reactive to reactive chemistry when you're doing a titration. We're not really concerned about the amount of product produced. Just exactly how much of this will react with exactly how much of this. So because of the net and equation that's being used here, I've got one extra step to watch out for. Start with what I know. So leaders got to do that all the time. 0.100 moles of K2Cr2O7 per liter. And then that next step is I've got to get it into the balanced equation which has the uh, dichromate ion, but not the potassium dichromate. So for every one mole, or two or seven, there's one mole of dichromate ions in there. I need that extra thing just to change the units and maintain the right relationship. And then I can do the stoichiometry of one mole of this makes six moles of this. Chromate on the bottom. Six moles of iron plus two ions. That's as far as I have to take. I think it's just a coincidence that um, this is the same number that was on the previous problem. But we're not done there. That's the moles, and it's got to be moles per liter, not moles by itself. So now for part two of this, I'll finish it off. Moles of the iron two ion, 50 milliliters of that solution. Remember, if you're solving for molarity, it's probably a two-step stoichiometry thing that stuff I did there. If you try to force it into one continuous factor label, it just makes a mess and you'll probably make it wrong. Um, three is a really simple one, actually. We'll just scratch out real quick. Sulfuric acid and potassium hydroxide reacting. 
Please. You're going to make some kind of salt. In this case, potassium sulfate in water. The two hydroxides will react with the two hydrogens, so I'm going to need two of these. I'll make two water molecules. I've got 28 grams of facade. I know the molarity of values. So I want to find out the of a 8.37. So mathematically, this is the easiest problem with KOH. I get my mole and mole ratio, so I'm going to just go grams into moles. 56.1 grams KOH per mole. Two moles makes one mole. KOH on the bottom. One mole of sulfuric acid on the top. And I know the molarity of the sulfuric acid. It's 8.37 moles per liter. I'm turning my molarity upside down because naturally it says I have to doesn't specify what units, so liters or milliliters would both be good for that answer. So that one can be done straight back to label because we're given the molarity and we're asked to solve for the volume. But again, reactant to reactant. Um, what's going on? Next part, I'm going to do a little demonstration, but first let's get some terminology out of the way. In a volumetric analysis, the titrant contains a substance that reacts in a known manner with the sample being analyzed. So you know what the chemical reaction is supposed to be between the titrant and the sample. The point in the titration where enough titrant has been added to react exactly with the sample is called the equivalence point. Equivalence point. This point is often marked by an indicator. which is a substance that changes color at or very near the equivalence point. So you're doing the uh, titration, you're adding your, your, your uh, titrant when the reaction's done, when all the reactants have reacted with each other just right. And a chemical indicator is used for that purpose. The point at where the indicator actually changes color is called titration. This is where it tells you, okay, we got the color change, stop titrating, take your measurements and calculate. The goal is to choose an indicator such that the end point occurs exactly at the equivalence point, where just enough titrant has been added to react with all the sample being tested, so that we got equal quantities of both the reactants, and they've completely reacted with each other. So before I take this example, let me show you a little bit what that terminology means. When we do our lab, we're going to be working with all this equipment. We're going to have, it's, it's kind of like the most uh, science-y lab that we do all year. 
we have all the breads out, so we've got all the expensive glassware, we got the expensive scales out, uh, we get the magnetic stirs out because who doesn't want to play with magnetic stirs? We'll get that out. And then we've got the, the, the oven out, and we've got like, I don't know, three times 20, we got like 75 Erlenmeyer flasks, and there's just, everything's out. And, uh, that's the best part, right? The magic of the magnetic stir. So uh, a magnet wrapped in plastic, and then a uh, this is a hot plate and magnetic stir together. There's a magnet under here that spins. When you turn the dial, you can control the speed of that magnet spinning, and then this one sticks to it. And uh, it's not going too fast. <laughs> And then uh, one magnet spins the other magnet. So uh, now we got our stirrer. You're not going to pay attention if that's spinning, I can tell. We've got sodium hydroxide solution. I'm going to put that in this one. You think I'm going to spill, don't you? These bottles are really good for pouring into burettes. You usually do it without a funnel. That, I'm gonna put some acid in this one. Hydrochloric acid. indicator, which is going to be phenolphthalein as my indicator today. And then before we do anything with that, um, usually what I like to do is zero up the uh, burette. Right now I, I overfill them and then I bring it down. The scale doesn't begin to here. Zero is right here. So I like to blast out any air bubbles that are in the tip and then drop by drop get it down to zero. That side's ready, and then I'm going to do it over here, too. Blast out the air bubble. Whoa. All right, that's zero. Give or take. Um, then I need to – typically, we'd have one that's a standard, one that's been standardized uh, already. And um, here's the reaction that we're going to do. We've got HCl, we've got NaOH, and we're going to make some salt water and some water. And it's already balanced just the way it is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to analyze the molarity of my HCl. I'm going to figure out how many moles it is, and I'm going to take a certain volume here in a moment so we know. And my sodium hydroxide, I have standardized that so I know that it's 0 0.110 molar of sodium hydroxide. And I got to figure out how many milliliters of this is going to react with this. This is going to be my known side. I know the molarity of this. All I have to do is figure out how much of it is is and then I can use this information to analyze this side. So I'm going to start by taking a certain amount of hydrochloric acid here, solution of unknown concentration, and then I'm figuring maybe 20 milliliters. Yes. Oh, let's maybe go for 25 milliliters. And your burettes, you can measure all the way down to the hundredth of a milliliter. So uh, 
you get the bottom of the meniscus right on the line. This was 25.00 milliliters. I can figure out the moles in that 25 milliliters. I can figure out the molarity. Now I got the sodium hydroxide. And this is my known, this is my standard that I'm going to compare it to. And do this. And do this. And I won't know that all the sodium hydroxide is reacted with all the acids until an indicator changes color. So for phenothaline, it is colorless. <laughs> it is colorless uh, in an acid solution. But it's pink color when it comes in contact with the base. And when I touch the stopper to the thing, it went right up into the burette. It won't affect anything. I'm going to put a stir in there. It's too much. I gotta turn that down. And uh, I'm gonna start titrating. Was that zero? Right, Ali? Yeah. Good. And as I add the uh, base to it, table here. As I add the base to it, um, it's going to flash little bits of pink color because the indicator is pink in the presence of a base. But as soon as the acid mixes with it, you see that the solution is still acidic because it's clear. I just got all this pink stuff on it. That's where it's kind of making it hard to see what's going on. And by the way, I can add water to it because adding water to it is not going to change how many moles are in here. So I just want to get some of that pink stuff off the uh, sides there. There, I don't see any pink. If I titrate away, the pink color is flashing there where it's hitting the solution, but it's not spreading out. So I know I'm a little bit of ways away from it turning colors. But I don't want to shoot past the end point. I notice when I put a little squirt in there, it turns pink, and then it goes back to clear. And the longer that pink lingers there, the closer it is to uh, the end point of this reaction. So I'm going to slow it down a little bit here. Because even drop by drop, it's not clearing up that well. I pause, it clears up. Not quite to the equivalence point yet. That was one drop and it lingered. Ooh, it kind of stayed pink. So I'm really close now. I'll give it one more drop. Oh, that was two. And we're a faint pink. That might be pretty good. When we do the lab, we're gonna be looking for a faint pink color that lingers and stays that way for like 30 seconds to a minute. That didn't stay. One more drop. That's a really good color. If it would stay that color, I think it's going to fade out one more time. I've got a drop hanging from the tip, so I'm going to just knock that drop off with some water and get that in there. It's already been measured. If that pink stays and lingers, that's a really good color to indicate we've started the crossover from being acidic to basic. And uh, I'm going to say that that really, really faint pink is a good color to stop it right there. If I go just a couple drops too many, it can turn like this deep magenta color, and that's way past the end point. So that, that's kind of the thing that you're going to be doing later in the week when you're doing your titrations. Well, of course, I can uh, go back to clear if I just a little bit of acid in there. So anyway, now what I would do is I would measure this here, and it's uh, 42, and I've got to get down there to the 100th place, and it's 
42.30 milliliters. So I know everything about the sodium hydroxide and how much was needed. I can use this to analyze the moles and then the volume and the molarity of the HCl solution. So uh, that's kind of like how a titration works. The endpoint being indicated by that pink color. You want it pink again, don't you? We don't want to stay there. I don't even know if I can get it back at this point. Take a look at another one, just kind of now that we know a little of the terminology, we can take a look at what this citric acid example is going to do. Citric acid contains one mole of reactable hydrogen ions per mole of citric acid. That's the hydrogen out in front. A vitamin tablet containing citric acid, vitamin C, has a mass of 1.300 grams. The sample is dissolved in water. The tablet is dissolved in 100 milliliters of water. <coughs> Bring up those ions. And the solution is titrated with 0 0.0 200 molar sodium hydroxide. It takes 14.93 milliliters of this sodium hydroxide base to neutralize the acid. And from there, we should figure out the mass percent of the citric acid in the tab tablet. So how many grams of citric acid that 1.3 gram tablet. So we know the formula. We can just set this up. A weak acid, because it's not on our list of strong acids, but it's an acid nonetheless, and it's sodium hydroxide. It's going to make HOH and sodium citrate. C6H7O7. And it's already balanced one hydrogen reacting with one hydroxide to make one water molecule. It's all good. I know some things about the citric acid. I know I have a 1.300 gram tablet. I also know that I want to find how many grams of citric acid are in that tablet. So that's really what I'm solving for. And I've got 0.200 molar of sodium hydroxide, and it took 14.93 mil with it. So I'm going to use my titrant, sodium hydroxide, of known concentration and volume to figure out the citric acid stuff. Your singing sounds off today. Fourteen point nine milliliters, point two hundred molar of NaOH, moles per liter. One mole reacts with one mole. And one mole of citric acid has a molar mass of 192.1 grams per mole. Five, seven, four grams. And that's almost the answer. I mean, that's this part, but I want to know the mass percent. So up to the side here somewhere where I don't have, I don't have 
we want. That's how many grams of citric acid is. And the mass of the tablet was 1.300 grams. So the part over the whole. Typical quantitative analysis, figuring out the percent purity in something or the composition of something. <laughs> or a little bit more terminology your way. The 192.1 yeah. is the molar mass of this compound. Yes. yes. So I'm going to throw two terms at you here, um, and they're terms that we use in our lab as well. First one is standardization. When you're doing a titration, you often have to standardize a solution, your known, con your known titrant. You have to often standardize it to make sure you know exactly what its molarity is. And that process is called standardization. It's the process of determining the exact molarity of a titrant by reacting it with a known amount of a known purity reactant, which we will call the primary standard. So to give you an idea of uh, how we're going to do that in the lab, we're going to be using some sodium hydroxide in the lab. And sodium hydroxide does not come pure. It, they don't even tell you what the purity is on it. You can't order it in like a high purity sodium hydroxide either. They just know it's not pure. Um, I don't know if it's the manufacturing process is part of the problem. Um, but I, knew, I do know one thing about sodium hydroxide is when you take off the cap, it immediately starts sucking in moisture from the atmosphere. So you're adding water weight or mass to the stuff and it actually starts getting shiny the longer it sits out and then it starts getting a little bit goopy and it sticks together, it becomes a mass. And if you just let it sit out, it's just gonna turn into like a solution of sodium hydroxide, just sucking stuff out of the, out of the air. So I know that's a problem as well. So then what we do, sodium hydroxide solution for our lab, which we do, we have to standardize it against the primary standard, and the primary standard that we use is potassium hydrogen phthalate, known as KHP. And this stuff is, a, is an acid, um, it's a solid acid, but it's a very high known purity. It's 99.97% pure. So if we know it's purity, we can use this, titrate it with this, and figure out the exact molarity of this stuff. So it's kind of like, this would be my KHP, I know everything about this, and once I know the concentration of that acid solution, then I could use that acid solution as a titrant if I wanted to. So the primary standard that we're using is KHP, but it's a high quality, pure chemical used to standardize analytical reagents. They're also pretty expensive because if you want to get high grade purity stuff, it's going to cost you. It's usually a solid acid. If you're trying to standardize a base solution like we are, we're going to have a sodium hydroxide basic solution and KHP is our solid acid. But it could be a solid base of known purity that we use to standardize an acid solution as well. So in our lab, Oxide, and we're going to use KHP to do it.
So number five uses sodium hydroxide and KHP in this example. And it's not the numbers that we would use in our lab, but it's actually pretty close to what um, our calculation would look like as we do the standardizing process for our sodium hydroxide solution. <coughs> So a student uses two grams of the primary standard solid sodium or potassium hydrogen phthalate. Um, it's got a purity of 100% in this case. It's abbreviated as KHP because nobody likes writing out the formula for potassium hydrogen phthalate. We want to use that to accurately determine the concentration of a sodium hydroxide solution. If point milliliters of sodium hydroxide is required to react the endpoint, what's the molarity of the sodium hydroxide? So let's start out with the formula for KHP, which I don't know off the top of my head. I know there's potassium and there's hydrogen. There's a bunch of carbons, eight of them. Four hydrogens and four oxygens. The acid nature of this one's kind of disguised. When it dissolves, it gives off a hydrogen and it gives off a potassium, but it produces hydrogens. This is the phthalate that stays behind. And this is the hyd potassium hydrogen part that gets uh, dissolved into water. So that's the one acidic hydrogen out there in front that's produced. It reacts with sodium peroxide. water. That hydrogen is going to react with that and then some other stuff. I don't really care what the other stuff is because I know one acid molecule is going to react with one base molecule. That's all I need to know. There's a one to one mole ratio between those, right? So. Last hour, I just wrote down KHP plus sodium hydroxide equals water and stuff, and that bothered them. So this time, I did half as much stuff to bother you. Two grams of this reacts with 48 of this. I want to know how many moles of that it is so I can figure out the molarity and standardize that sodium hydroxide solution. We're going to use the information for the sodium hydroxide we are standardizing. So now it's pretty easy math. I'm just going to write it as KHP because that's easier. It even gives me the molar mass, grams per one mole KHP. React with one mole of sodium hydroxide. Below 9793 NaOH. And I can use that to figure out the molarity. 9793 moles of NaOH per. 48.25 milliliters. I'm just going to convert that into uh, liters right away because I don't feel like writing it. That's just two five liters. And now we know the molarity of the sodium hydroxide solution. If you know the molarity of the sodium hydroxide solution and you base that off a primary standard of high quality purity, then you can say with certainty, okay, now I've got a sodium hydroxide solution of known molarity and I can use that to titrate against acids in day two of our reaction. Um, 
That's a good question. I mean, they do uh, chemical analysis. Some of it is done very similar to what we're doing here. Um, but then, you know, it's always a question of like, how do you know your standard is pure enough? Um, they can do a variety of different things. One of the things they can do is, uh, they can do like a, like a Mac, mass spectrometer or something that will actually you put a sample in there and it will literally count the atoms of each element in the molecule. And you can see that it's got the right proportions. Um, but usually what's going to happen in a case like that is they're going to have, you know, first off a procedure for making a chemical compound that's, that's been tried and proven over and over again. And then they'll take that and they'll uh, run it against a couple different standards just to make sure the sample, the product that they produced was of, of high enough purity. I actually find with this, that when I order it, I'm always excited to see what the purity is because I've had samples that are over 100% before. Yeah, 100.04 was the best one I had most recently. And the reason that was possible um, was because they knew, based on their analysis, that not only did I have KHP, but I also had NAHP. They knew that there was because potassium and um, sodium are very, very similar in their uh, chemical behaviors. They're alkaline metals. They're right next to each other, top and bottom. They knew from their chemical analysis that there was just a tiny amount of sodium hydrogen phthalate in there. And because its molar mass was a little bit smaller, that made this molar mass a little bit smaller. That made this a little bit bigger. And they knew how to allow you to adjust for it. So they were basically saying, use this number based on the fact that we know that there's a little bit of contamination in there. So they could uh, help you mathematically do it. I haven't had one over 100% for a while. I've been getting a lot of these at 99.9. Close, but not quite. I've never had a bottle that said 100% pure. I can't get, I can't get that number yet. But and this is like a eighty dollar jar of chemicals just because it's high purity. Whereas the sodium hydroxide is like a ten dollar jar. I don't understand why they went over one hundred and something It's an adjustment acknowledging the fact that they've got some of this stuff in there and that changes the molar mass. So when you do your calculations, they're adjusting for your calculations for you. Let's take a look at one more, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do six with you, and then I'm going to have you do seven and eight on your own because those are easily approachable without any guidance. But number six has a lot of little wordiness in, in it, and people have a hard time figuring out how to set it up sometimes. Here, a chemist is going to analyze an alloy for silver. So an alloy is a mixture of metals melted together. Um, this alloy has some silver in it. A two and a half gram sample of the alloy is first dissociated or dissolved in acid. This brings the silver ions into the solution as a silver one ion. The solution is then titrated with 38.4 milliliters of a half molar potassium thiocyanate solution. And this precipitates the silver as silver thiocyanate. We want to figure out the mass percent of silver in the alloy. So mathematically, it's kind of set up like the uh, citric acid one where you're trying to figure out the citric acid in the tablet. We're just trying to figure out the silver in the two and a half gram sample of the alloy. So the part that makes this a little bit clumsy is first they tell you that you take this and then acid subject. Brings out the silver ions and then the The actual reaction that you're doing, or the titration you're doing, is silver plus potassium thiocyanate, precipitating some silver thiocyanate. And it 
we'll get some potassium pinned out of there as well. Because when potassium thiocyanate reacts, it's got to kick out the potassium. So just getting to the part in black is where there is some confusion. But now it becomes fairly straightforward. We've got 38.4 mil of a 0.500 molar. We want to figure out how many grams of this are in that two and a half gram sample of the alum. And the molar mass of silver ions is the same as the molar mass of silver. You do not have to do anything special. Pretty much all the mass of an atom comes from its protons and its neutrons, and the electrons are a negligible amount of their mass. So I'm going to use the molar mass of silver. Out to be 2.07 grams. Then if there's 2.07 and the alloy weighed two and a half grams. That would mean that 82.8%, which was up there for the answer already, would be the percentage is over in the sample. But as far as the stoichiometry goes, this is some of the most plain and straightforward stoichiometry you're going to get. But getting the equation organized and then doing a little percent composition afterwards is where the work comes in. You guys take a look at what you can do with seven and eight on your own. And we'll put some answers up there a little bit so you can check how you did. Yeah. I don't, but I got a lot of paper towel. clinics last week. Let's see if I have some in my office. I'm meaning to bring a box down here.
Metaionic equation for number eight. Um, you got to take that permanganate ion to potassium permanganate mole to mole ratio and work that in there. And that's a one to one ratio because that's just talking about in this compound what's the relationship permanganate to potassium. Every time we've done one of those extra mole to mole steps, it's been a one to one ratio so far, and, and the Last thing they asked me, second block, or first block was, uh, will it always be a one-one ratio? And here's like what would happen if it wasn't. Like if we had calcium per manganese instead of potassium per manganese, you know, the equation would still look the same. The only thing that I would have had different is I would have had a molarity and, and a volume of uh, calcium per manganese. If that was the case, then I would have had for every one mole of calcium per magnet, two moles of the per magnet ion on the top because there's a one to two ratio in that molecule. But so far, all the examples I've used, I think I've done like three different ion to ion things. They've so far only been one to one mole ratios. So just watch out for when they're not. So why do you that step for me for not seven? With seven, um, I probably should have. Uh, I I treated it like it was. Uh, I treated it like it was sodium hydroxide when I was doing it in my head, but it's hydroxide, so I probably should have had for every uh, one mole of NaOH. There's one. Uh, hydroxide ion so that I put it into the uh, net ion equation. I kind of balanced in my head just like um, if it was an acid plus sodium hydroxide and that's a one-to-one -one ratio and I didn't even really look at the equation myself. So that was my neglect. Give you the same answer though because it's one-to-one. -one. Uh, potassium permanganate um, it's a basic science. It's not an, it would act like a basic salt. Yeah, so it, it would act like a base in this case. It's not your typical uh, acid-base reaction that you guys, because it is again a redox reaction. And it's taking place in, in an acid solution, so that's why there's an extra hydrogen over here. Um, but if you're just working off the equation that's provided, it's still just a titration where you know the reactants and you can compare them to each other. So, like, is it just for the, I'm just like using, because 
So the, two, the only time they can use the coefficient is when you're doing your mobile ratios. That's the only time those come in. I'm talking to a ratio here. When you're taking the compound and breaking it down into the ion, then you're looking internally, and there's a one-to-one -one ratio between the compound and the ion. And if it was this case, there would be a one-to-two ratio between the whole thing and the ion. In that one, but you only use the coefficients once. Any others? That's as far as I wanted to get today. Tomorrow we're going to launch you into some stuff with pH, pOH, concentration of hydroxide, concentration of hydronium in solution. It's kind of some stuff that we should know from first year chemistry, but we don't, so we spend an extra day just kind of working on developing some stuff there. And that's where more of the supplemental stuff will come in because that was the end of four. Next uh, three or four pages are kind of our supplemental stuff that we're adding to the chapter. So you still got all the notes, but so I'm finished them. That's all. Um, Give me tonight to to uh, lay everything out. I just thought of that this morning, and I was just like, you know what? That might ultimately be the easiest way to do it. Because you don't need me for a test. Although the one thing it will cut you off on is extra time. You can't have a sub getting started early and running late and all that stuff, so you'll have to work from bell to bell. But... I was going to start working on that anyway. This is a doable test in, a, in the time that's available. So is this test like less points? Or just like that? No, this is going to still be a 100 point test. And then we're going to add a 40 point redox test quiz onto that. We still have a, a lot of points coming from chapter four. But if you look at the amount of time we spend on it, there's just a lot of stuff there too. A lot of little things to keep organized. And your extra credit will come in with this chapter too, because uh, this is a lab where I give you extra credit based on the quality of your results. So not only do we bring out all the fancy glassware and all the expensive equipment, this is the lab where you hit the bullseye. You can bump yourself up a, a letter grade worth of points. Hmm? Let's just say the write-up is going to be pretty easy. You're going to do a write-up, but the write-up's going to be simpler than the previous write-ups. You got more trials to calculate, but it's going to really be quick to grade for me because I'll be looking for one number. Went over to my uh, brother-in-law and sister-in-law's house. They had me over for dinner on Friday night. My wife didn't want to go. Oh well, pick me up and drop me off. Got the full service. Pretty much. My wife does not get along with her family. They love me. I'm treated like a king when I'm over there. So that was a Friday, Saturday, went to my mom's for dinner. Got my uh, apple pie every year. My birthday birthday cake is an apple pie. It's what I expect. I actually got two apple pies. One's for myself and one's for everybody else. <laughs> a 
watch the Ryder Cup a little bit and uh, football. Good weekend for sports. No, I really didn't get any birthday presents. My kids are cheap bastards. They'll never get me anything. I should, yeah, and I got to pay for the wedding. What's wrong with them? Hmm. Oh, well. They just give me crap I don't want anyway. I don't buy my wife stuff, so she doesn't buy me stuff, so it works out pretty good that one. I was fed well. That's all that matters. Are we going to know any of the songs from uh, Legally Blonde, the musical? Are there any, like, known songs in there? Anybody? Do they, like, use some, like, other, you know, familiar songs that they pulled into the musical, or did they write music around? Oh, I know. All I hear right now after school is a lot of noise, so we haven't gotten to the, like, singing. You can do all of the textbook assignment, I believe, at this stage. Bye. Um, I figured it's probably time that I followed up about letter of recommendation. Possibly. Um, thank you. Thank you.